Okay. I have some um, good news and some bad news. We'll start with the bad news. The bad news is apparently we've lost one of our presenters. I don't know if it's the snowstorm and the airports. They're coming from Stanford, so that's a little fishy if that's the excuse. Um, but our second paper from the uh, Stanford group with Temple, um, they're, they're not here. So that's the bad news. The good news is the other two papers, including our best paper nominee, are here, and that means they can talk longer and you can ask more questions because we're not quite on the same tight uh, schedule as we would have been otherwise. And maybe at the end you still have time to pop out and catch somebody else's third paper uh, if, that, if that works for you. So um, I think we're going to get started because I think our video is running. Yes, thumbs up on the video running back there, great. So um, welcome to the first uh, panel session on the first day of the conference after that lovely keynote. I know we're all energized. And today uh, in this panel, we're here to talk about modeling student behavior. And our first paper, why don't you come and put your computer in, get your title up. Our first paper is called Detecting Changes in Student Behavior from Clickstream Data. And our speaker today is Yihung Park from Irvine with a uh, really fine uh, group of co-authors. So um, if you're ready to roll, we're ready to roll. Okay. Great, thank you. Help me uh, welcome Jiyoung. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Jian Park. I'm a computer science PhD student at UC Irvine. And I'm gonna talk about detecting changes in student behavior using clickstream data. This is a joint work uh, between the Department of Computer Science and the School of Education at UC Irvine. And we would like to thank National Science Foundation for supporting our work. Uh, the order of the talk will be the following. First, I'll talk about the data that we're going to use. I'll give you the motivation to the problem. Um, I'll, I'm going to walk you through the methodology, and then I'll go through the results of the real data set. And then we're going to summarize at the end. Let's first talk about the data. These days, Bourne universities are using the learning management system, such as Canvas or, Clickstream, uh, Canvas or Blackboard, as a new way of interacting with the course material. At UC Irvine, we used Canvas, and this is what uh, the original Clickstream data looked like. And the first column there is a student ID that's anonymized, and then there is a URL, and uh, there is a timestamp, and the IP address for each click event. So we process the data that I showed before so that we have the number of clicks, number of clicks per day throughout the days for each student, something like shown below. And we use this type of data for our analysis. There will be two data sets in this talk. First is the course data from UC Irvine. This is a 10-week face-to-face course, uh, and there were activities before and after the quarter, so we took 85 days as a data set. And then uh, there were 377 students. Also, uh, we're going to use the simulated data as a proof of concept. We made it similar to the actual data set, so uh, there were 400 students and uh, for 85 days. To give you an idea what the real data look like, um, I'll show you this plot. The y-axis of this plot shows the number of clicks per day averaged over all the students. The x-axis is, and the x-axis is the days, so we have the average number of clicks per day by students throughout the days. Um, this is from the 10-week face-to-face course that I mentioned. And here we can see some general trends um, of students clicking behavior. For example, you see, um, you see these uh, three p high peaks. And actually, they are 
those peaks are the days right before the exam dates. There were four exams here. I'll show you another picture. Um, this matrix shows the number of click events per day for each student, where, e where each row is a student and the columns are the days. So there are 377 rows which correspond to each student. Um, so using this plot, we can actually get the previous bar plots by taking the average by the column. And here the darker color means uh, there are more clicking activities and the whiter color means there are less activities. And here again, we are able to see those uh, four lines, which are the days right before the exam dates. However, the, the important point that I want to make is that it's really hard to see what the individual student is doing. So what we want to do is we want to make some sense out of this data uh, at the individual student level. I'll continue to talk a little more about the motivation of this work. This is uh, the raw click stream data that I just showed you. We can see the general trends of the overall students, but the data is quite noisy and it's hard to understand um, the individual student's activity. Um, therefore, the motivation of our work is to develop statistical methods that can extract useful information at the level of individual students relative to the whole class. And this helps us understand better about the student's course engagement. And we're interested in the course engagement because uh, we're talking about the real university courses and it's not like MOOCs where there are thousands of students taking the class and uh, more than half of them drops. <clears throat> also, uh, among the statistical methods, we focus on the change detection for the data, uh, such as can we detect the meaningful change in student beha students' behavior. And moreover, um, uh, we can explore something, uh, explore how the student activity change might be related to the course outcomes. Now I'm going to talk about our methodology. There will be two parts. First, I'm gonna talk about uh, modeling the student behavior without any change points. And then after that, we're gonna talk about detecting the change point uh, and the model with a change point. We use Poisson regression model and the Poisson regression model is based on the Poisson distribution, uh, which is a distribution for counts. And there's one parameter in Poisson distribution, which is a mean, I'll call it lambda. And, in Poiss uh, and the Poisson distribution is uh, modeling this mean parameter lambda. And for our case, we're modeling this mean parameter lambda for each student i on each day t. This equation uh, is our model. It looks quite simple. We used uh, log of lambda i t equals to uh, some linear function, and we used log of lambda i t to guarantee that the estimates of lambda i t is larger than zero. And the mu t here is the general trend of the population that we discussed, and the alpha i is the random uh, is the individual random effect for student i, um, and it's going to be a constant value for each student i. And this alpha i will tell us if the student is more active or less active compared to the population. This graph is generated from the 400 simulated data that I mentioned in the data, data section. Uh, the y-axis of this uh, log, uh, y-axis of this graph is the log of lambda it, 
and the x-axis is the days. And this, uh, this graph is only showing up to the first 30 days out of 85 days. The blue graph, the, the middle graph here, is the population graph, which is the mu t, where the alpha i is set to zero. And there are two student graphs, uh, one green dotted line and one red dotted line. And, the, and these two graphs show the two students who are more active and less active. So the green student, uh, which is on top of the population graph, has alpha i larger than zero, and it means that the student was more active than the uh, relative to the population. And also this uh, red student showed less activities and the alpha i is uh, set to, uh, estimated as less than zero. So you can see that these two students have the exact same pattern as the population mean, uh, popula uh, population mean, but they're shifted vertically. So I would say the mu t is, uh, captures the pattern of the overall students, and the alpha i would be the offset or the vertical shift of that population graph. Okay. Now we'll talk about how to detect changes in student behavior based on the model that we just saw. Our method for change point detection works in two steps. So for each student, first we find a model with change point. This, uh, this model two, model with, a change, with change point. And then in step two, uh, we select a better model between the model without the change point and the model with the change point. This uh, gray one, the model without the change point, is the model that we just discussed where there is no change point. And the model two is from the step, step one here. And we're gonna uh, compare these two models by using uh, BIC scores, and I'm gonna talk about this later in the later part. First, uh, let's talk a little more about uh, how to find the change point model. The model with the change point is just an extension of the student modeling that we just talked. Uh, but instead of fitting one regression model, now we fit two different regression models one before the change point and one after the change point. Uh, this tau i in the blue circle, that's the change point for student i. And you can see that uh, there are two alphas now. There's alpha i1 and alpha i2, one before and after the tau i. Uh, this i is the indicator function, so everything um, that are not in that condition is set to zero. So how do we find this tau i? Um, in this graph, uh, in, if you look at the first, uh, first plot, there is an orange bar. And this, let's think this as a tau i, the change point. And what we're doing is we go through all the possible tau i's and then find the one that maximizes the log likelihood, which I'll show in the second plot. So if you're not familiar what the, about what the log likelihood is, just think it as a goodness of fit. So we want our model to have uh, the maximized log likelihood. I'll show you a quick animation of how to detect oh, how this works. Um. Oh, okay. So you can see that uh, you go through the, um, the each change point, and the log likelihood is calculated for that model, and then find um, find the uh, tau i that maximizes the log likelihood. So now we have tau i, and we have a model with change point. 
And now we want to find out uh, which model is better for each student's data. So is a model with the change point a better fit the data for, for the student or the model without the change point is better? As I said, we're going to use a criterion called uh, Bayesian information criterion. It's um, um, so BIC, you can think BIC as uh, a complexity minus the goodness of fit, where the complexity is proportional to the number of parameters that the model has, and minus the log likelihood, and the goodness of fit is the log likelihood. Uh, so basically what it does is it's penalizing the case with having more parameters because usually the model with more parameters would have higher log likelihood. And we want to make sure that adding, is adding more parameters worth doing, uh, worth doing it. And in our case, complexity for the model with the change point will be higher because we added uh, the tau i and uh, another alpha i. Since we want a model with smaller BIC score, for each student we compare the BIC score for, for each model, the model without the change point and model with the change point, and take the one that gave the smaller BIC score. So for example, if the, uh, if the model without the change point has a smaller BIC score, then we say that the change was not detected, and if the BIC score for the model with the change point is smaller, then we select the model with the change point and say um, uh, the change was detected. This is a simulated student data and the results. Uh, this data was artificially created to have a change point at this, at this green line. Um, and our methodology was able to detect the change point pretty close to the true change point, which is the red line. And if you look at the top plot, the top plot is the uh, log of lambda it graph, and you see that the uh, the blue graph, which is the model for with model with a change point that shifts after uh, before and after this red line. So because we have two alpha i's, the graph shifted. And the gray line is a model without the change point, so it, has, um, uh, it doesn't have any shifts. And here, the BIC score for the model with the change point was smaller. So we, uh, we found this, uh, we say that the detected, uh, we say that the change was detected for the student, and the student actually showed increase in their activity. Now I'm going to talk about the results of the UCI course data. There were actually two courses in our paper that we used for the paper, but we're going to focus on the first data set, which is a 10-week face-to-face course for uh, 85 days, and where there were uh, 377 students. Before we go into the change detection results, um, I'll first talk about the actual data that we used. Um, remember this uh, this matrix, which uh, is a total raw clicks. But this this clicks are very noisy. Actually, the smallest value in this uh, in this number of clicks per day was zero, but the maximum number of clicks per day was over thousands, and the mean and median was both around ten. So it the data itself ha is very noisy. And also there are all, uh, many unimportant information that we don't want to know. For example, if the student was browsing, <clears throat> browsing the course uh, website and probably only a subset of students will go to the discussion board and we don't want to capture all those uh, information. So we decided to focus on the file clicks and the file clicks include uh, opening a lecture notes and reading materials and opening uh, exam files. 
such as mock-up exams and previous exams and so on. And from here, we, <coughs> we define the preview and review click clicking behaviors, which is defined as, uh, for preview, is defined as opening a file before the deadline, and review clicks are defined as opening a file after the deadline. So preview can be, for example, opening a lecture notes before the lecture starts, and uh, for lecture notes, for uh, reviewing data, it includes opening a lecture note after the lecture ends. And for the lectures, we did not include the clicking activities during the class because they were very sparse. So you might get confused what these behaviors are, why, why are you talking about this? But as I said, these are just um, one way to filter out the noise from the noisy raw click data. And we're just taking the subset to have less uh, noisy and more, inform and more informative data. And uh, we, used, uh, we used both preview and review data for our paper, but in this talk, I'm going to focus on the review uh, uh, results on the review clicks. Uh, this, these are the uh, uh, examples of the two individual students. First, first student on the top is a student with a detected change. And if you look at the y-axis, this student was, make, uh, was clicking about five times before this, before this red line. And then after this, after this red line, the student clicked 25 times. And this student was detected as change with a change point here. And on the other hand, the student in the bottom, this student also clicked about five times before this red dotted line. But then after this line, the student clicked uh, uh, six or seven times. Well, the student clicked a little more than usual behavior, but uh, our model captures a change relative to the population mean rate, and the most of the students uh, in this class were active right before the final, so the student was not detected as changed. Uh, we're going to look at uh, all the students now. This matrix is the same kind of ma matrix that we saw before, but this is not the raw clicks now, and it's the number of review clicks. We, apply, we applied our change detection methodology to all of the 377 students and reordered them, and the results look like this. The red markers are the location of the change points. And the students, um, and for the second matrix, the students which are the rows, are first separated into three different groups. And within each group, uh, the students are, again, ordered by the location of the change point. Let's take a look at the first group, which is the increased group. These students are the students who increase their behavior, their clicking activities, uh, before the change point and to uh, after the change point. So you see a much darker color. Oops. Much darker color on the right side than the left side. And for the second group, which is uh, the decreased group, this shows that this, this we can see that there are darker colors on the left side of the change point than the right side of the change point. And these are the students who decrease their uh, reviewing activity. And the last group is a group with no change students. So we, these are the students uh, that did not change based on our methodology. And we can also see from here, they, they definitely show uh, the difference in their, uh, in their behavior, but they still share 
uh, the general pattern, we can still see those four, four lines where the exam dates were. So if you look at these two matrices side by side, um, they're the same data, but we have a lot more information about the individual students in the second plot. And um, not just focusing on how to explain better about uh, individual students' behavior, we try to provide some external validity of our methodology, and that leads to looking at the course outcomes. The gray bar on the right side is a probability of getting a passing grade, which is A, B, or C, and that's about uh, 0.83. And the three bars on the left side are the probabilities of getting a passing grade given that the student is in the increasing group, no change group, and in decreasing group, decreased group. And you can see that uh, a student being in, uh, in the increased group have a very high probability, higher probability of getting a passing grade. And it's, it's a much way above uh, the probability of getting a passing grade in general, and it's about like 0.93. And this probability was, was significant uh, with 95% confidence. And again, this decreased group of students uh, the probability of getting a passing grade being in, given that the student is in the decreasing group, they are far less than the general passing probability, which is about 0.75, and this probability was, was also significant with 95% uh, uh, confidence. So we found that this is not only just interesting, but also gives some motivation and uh, some validity, validity of our methodology. Now I'm going to summarize. Uh, we showed that uh, showed how to model uh, an individual student's clicking behavior over time relative to the whole population. Also, uh, we we talked about a change detection method for detecting changes in student behavior of individual students. And from there, uh, we were able to explain individual students clicking behavior uh, better relative to the population. And also we were able to relate the course engagement with behavior change patterns, such as increase or decrease. And we were, we also could find relations between the behavior change and the course outcomes. For future works, we, we, we thought that it's gonna be <clears throat> interesting to compare the same students in multiple courses and how, how, those uh, how the behavior change for those students differ from uh, in different courses. And also, we got the data after when the quarter was over, but once we have the data available in real time, it's, we can make small modification to our methodology to, uh, to have a real-time change detection method, and it's gonna be useful for instructors and the students so that it, once they get feedbacks uh, when the change was detected. And, uh, and we only talked about the frequentist methods, but it's gonna be interesting to uh, use Bayesian models to reflect some uh, uncertainties in inferences at this individual student level. For example, the alpha i's, the alpha i's might have a normal distribution or something like that. And we only talked about the change point model with one change point because it's a quarter base, so we only had 10 weeks of data. But once we have a longer term, term courses, it's, it's also going to be interesting to uh, find out 
the models with multiple change points. For example, if the student increased the behavior and then decreased and then increased back, something like that. And uh, the Python code will be released soon. I haven't released it yet, but if you want it, you can just email me. Um, I can send you the code. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Great, so we have lots of time for questions. I know there's some advanced technology in front of you and the urge might be to use it, but but I don't have the whole big control panel to turn on and off individual mics. So I think we're gonna go old school for the Q&A. So uh, raise your hands, I'll let you take your own questions and we have some time, so feel free. Yeah. Oh. And can you speak up so our recording can try to catch the question? Yeah, I didn't really oh. um, I, I think he first. First, doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, about Loud, please. I'm curious about your model. Uh, is there a reason that you don't have the interaction term in there? It was very interesting what you were doing, but capturing a, uh, a change in the actual pattern seems like it would give you more power. Is there, uh, is there something that limits that? No, I, I think we, we just started with the very simple, simplest model, and we just show that this simple model can be is still very interesting. But like, thanks for the comments. Like, thank yeah, you yeah, thank you. Yeah. In the students that you saw decreasing mm -hmm. in review, did they in turn increase in preview? Did you look at relationships between review um, and preview? Yes, we did look at those two, but they didn't have much relation. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we we haven't done that, but uh, thanks for the comments. We actually uh, tried this same type of Poisson regression model of of the aggregate behavior, the overall population using those covariates like gender and um, like other categories of file clicks. But we haven't applied those to this model. Yeah, but thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, uh -huh. What um, A, B, C are the course, the final course grade. Um, oh, there, there were four exams in this course, the uh, three midterms and one final. And there were, um, uh, I remember there was also assignments, but yeah, I think that was it. Oh, uh, we haven't done that, but yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, we thought about uh, comparing the scores that they got in the midterm, for example, and then if the student decreased the behavior after failing the midterm, that would be very interesting, yeah. But we thought about it, but we haven't actually dig into that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, increase or decrease. It can it can work in both ways, I guess. Like student might give up or student might yeah motivate it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh what do you mean by individual? Yeah, so that's why we talked about the probabilities, not uh, probabilities. So there, uh, there are also students who failed in the decreasing group, and there are students who uh, passed in the de uh, in the decreasing group as well. That's why we talked about the probabilities. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Like a lot of still fail. Um uh, uh how can we discern the students who Oh Mm -hmm. um, maybe they were just randomly browsing. It might not, the clicking activities can't capture the whole behavior. For example, the students who decrease their behavior, the student might be, uh, might have been just downloaded all the files in advance, um, probably uh, like in the first week of the class and then didn't click at all. And that could, be also a possibility for the decreasing stu decreased students. Yeah, I guess I answered that. Uh, well, go on this side. Yeah. Right. Have you looked at what are the forces uh, in four versus changing points? Uh, because I can imagine uh, it's, it's good to know uh, this change point is very related to the performance of uh, as the teachers or as the instructors. Um, yeah, can you repeat that? What's happening before the change points? So, for example, like if there were midterms or something like that, if there were exams or. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing that we found was that if you um, if you look at the second graph of this for the decreasing students, you see a lot of change points around this this point, right? And again, this point, which is the mid the first midterm and the and the final. So. It might be, so people who increased their behavior, they, they happen right before the first midterm and also the right before the final. And this, this, this kind of pattern, we could also see it in the preview activities. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, is the example of that? Louder, please. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's a really nice nice comment. Yeah, we we haven't found like uh, find out when these change point happened, and we haven't uh, explore about the location of these change points. But that'll be a nice uh, future work to do. Yeah, thank you.